Hey guys, Cassie here with Sew and Grow Together. Today I'm going to show you how to make my very favorite homemade bread. I've been making this bread for years and years. Super easy. I'm going to call it like the gateway to sourdough bread baking. It's not exactly sourdough. I'll give you a little bit of the differences. You can just keep this going and it's always a favorite. Hey and welcome. We are three families who come together to help each other grow in our faith, family, homesteading, and whatever else life throws our way. Join us on this journey as we sow and grow together. Okay, so you know how sometimes when you go to look at a recipe online, you get on there and then you realize you're reading the whole life story of this person and you're like, just give me the recipe. Okay, I'm gonna do that, but just a little bit. <laughs> So this bread recipe was actually given to my mother at her wedding as a wedding present. The recipe was handwritten. I'm going to try to find it. And they gave her a starter for it with the directions to feed the starter and for baking bread as well as cinnamon rolls. Now my mom was not big into cooking especially as they were married and realized they were both working. Dad was kind of picky and didn't always want what was cooked and it was just a whole thing and mom's like, I don't want to cook. But she still managed to make this bread and it was always a favorite when I was a kid too. So when I moved out and got my own place, she set me up with the bread pans and all the ingredients and a copy of the recipe. Since then, we have both killed the starters. I've had to restart it from scratch, and then I've done a little bit of research on bread baking in some other areas, and I've really kind of tweaked the recipe to what I want it to be, and you can do that too. That's the great thing about recipes, but it's essentially the same bread that was made my whole life. First of all, what's the difference between regular sourdough bread, legitimate sourdough bread, and this bread, which also has a starter. I do have over here, Sally, my uh, sourdough starter, who is, you know, I've just used her to make a loaf we're gonna bake today, so she's a little low, um, so I'll feed her later. But you feed a regular sourdough starter with flour and water. Now the type of flour and the type of water, you can get real picky about those things, but flour and water is what this gal eats. This starter, which I have just fed, is a little bit different. This is the one we're using today and it's fed with potato flakes like instant mashed potatoes. Just the flakes. Don't make the actual potatoes. Instant potatoes and sugar and water. And I'm gonna try to show you what it looks like but I've just fed this a few hours ago and I keep it in a quart size mason jar and I'll give you a little bit of information about starters in general here. Let me put this down. So starters, what on earth? What is a starter? Why have it? What does it do? The starter takes the place of yeast in bread baking and making other things. So if you are using dry active yeast, that's something that's a more modern approach where they have, have yeast that's been dehydrated and you can just rehydrate it and use it which seems really convenient, and it is, and I use it for some recipes. The benefit of sourdough starter, using that instead of a dry active yeast that's instant, you have a longer fermentation period, and that is beneficial in several ways. If somebody is a little bit intolerant, not intolerant, if somebody is a little sensitive to gluten, it starts breaking down the things that you would be sensitive to so that your body can handle it a little more readily. Also, it just gives it more depth of flavor, gives it that little bit of sour. The longer it ferments, the more of a sour taste it's going to have. So the real sourdough starter, this stuff, that you're making real sourdough bread, I, you know, we have Adriana who is sensitive to gluten and has some issues, headaches and different things if she eats something with gluten in it or eats too much of it. The sourdough bread doesn't seem to bother her. Now this what I'm showing you today does bother her. It doesn't have quite the same fermentation process. Now I'm not getting on here to ever insinuate or tell you in any way that bread is a health food because like, it's really just not. But I would say that anything that you make at home with your own ingredients is going to be better than what you're gonna buy at the store most of the time. So while this bread isn't top-notch healthiest, 
It is delicious. And when eaten within reason and not too much of it, you know, it's better than the stuff that you're gonna buy in the bread aisle at the grocery store. And there's just something about having fresh bread. It is, it's one of the staples in my house when we have company and we do that often. You know, when you walk in the door and the house smells like fresh baked bread, like what is better than that? And when the kids can just keep coming back and grabbing a slice and some homemade jelly, like, Really, that's what childhood is made of, right? <laughs> so we just like to do that. And it, it really complements a lot of things. Whatever meal that we're making, bread as a side usually goes okay. A lot of soup in the winter, things like that, or pretty much anything. You can have a loaf of bread with it. So let's talk a little bit about the starter. The reason my mom and I both killed ours around the same time is life just kind of got busy. It was when I was first having, you know, I had little babies and I was busy and she was busy. What we would do is put the starter, put a lid on it, like an airtight lid, and put it in the refrigerator. You can keep it there for weeks, even months. And when you finally go to take it out, if it's been there a while, you might have to feed it and then dump some in a day or so later and feed it again until it's really good and active and then be ready to use it. If you've left it in there a long time, it might take a little while before it really starts bubbling again. But both of us left it for over a year in the back of the fridge and then one of us remembered and was like, man, it's been a long time since we've made that bread and we killed it. So I had to go back and dig through the recipe and I scoured the internet for, an, for a recipe that was similar to see if I could see how to start my own and how, or how I could revive that recipe. What I found that the recipe was um, a variation of what I would see a lot online as Amish friendship bread. And there are different varieties of that. Some are a little more labor intensive than others. This one is super easy. I say super easy, maybe because I've done it so much I don't even have to think about it, but really it's it's really easy. And what I did to revive this was I started a starter, a sourdough starter, the way you would traditionally start a sourdough starter. So you could do that by mixing equal parts flour and water and then dumping about half of it and doing that again and dumping it and doing it again and feeding it really regularly until the natural yeast and everything in the flour starts to live and feed on the flour that you feed it. And that's how you start a sourdough starter. Anybody could do it. But if you already have a traditional sourdough starter, you can use that to begin this sourdough starter. Then what you would do is you would feed it with sugar. And while I use, I use cane sugar, like raw cane sugar for pretty much anything we eat. But when it comes to feeding the starter, I still go back to the cheap stuff because we use sugar and other things that I'll save that for. And this is just for feeding my starter. You can definitely use the raw cane sugar, but it takes three fourths of a cup every time I feed it. And I feed it and a day or so before I make bread, which happens once or twice a week. So I just keep some of this. It's about three fourths a cup of sugar and then three tablespoons of potato flakes. And because I find those boxes annoying to deal with, I just pour some in a jar and then I use the spoon. It's just easier to open this than get my measuring spoon into one of those boxes where the flap, you know what I'm talking about? And then you would add water. When this starter is ready to use, after you've fed it, it'll be bubbly. If it's quiet in the room, you can put your ear next to it and hear the little popping sounds. Then you would use it in the recipe that I will share with you. So the timing for me, when the starter is very good and active and it's ready to use, and the temperature in the room is not freezing. If your kitchen is very cold or wherever you're trying to let your dough rise, it's gonna take longer, so that would affect your timing. But if, if it's normal room temperature around 70 degrees, if it is a very active starter, here's my timing. If I need it Thursday night for dinner, I will start Wednesday at some point during the day, I'll feed my starter because Wednesday night, the night before, I will start the dough. 
Now, last week I forgot the night before, but the starter was fed and active, so that morning I started it. But it didn't have as much time to rise. So where I usually split it into three bread pans, I only split it into two. And I actually have a little bit of that bread left, and I don't know if you can see. It's a little more dense than I like and heavier. It's not quite as light and fluffy, but it still tastes pretty good. So if there was a way to mess this up, I have probably found it and done it, honestly. And I can't say that there was ever a time that the bread was not good. There are definitely times it's been better. Oh, there was one time our oven broke while I was making the bread and just burnt it to a crisp. Okay, so that time, no. <laughs> but any other time, even if I messed it up, still delicious, it still got eaten, it was good. All right, let's walk through the process just a little bit. This is my starter and how it sits on my counter most of the time. It's in a quart jar covered by a cheesecloth, which is breathable. It's important that when you're leaving it out that it has oxygen, but you don't want gnats or different bugs or anything like that to be able to get in it. I also don't want um, any food or anything splashing into it. So I cover it with cheesecloth. I double it at least. Sometimes I fold it in half again so that while oxygen is still able to get through, the bugs are not. And here I have set aside already measured out three fourths cup of sugar. Now this is not at all precise. Usually I just dump the sugar in straight from the bag without measuring and I know just about what that looks like. And I just dump it right on top there. Next we have the potato flakes. And I will use a spoon, although not normally a measuring spoon. Usually I just use a regular spoon and I get three heaping spoonfuls and put it on top of the sugar that I've just put in there. And the reason I use a regular spoon is because then I use it to stir the mixture in after I add the water. Then you'll add about a cup of room temperature water. Usually I just take it straight to the sink and pour it in until the jar is almost full, leaving a little bit of head space because it will kind of grow, especially when it's really active. Now we have well water, so we do not have chlorine or anything in there. If you have trouble keeping a starter alive, you may consider using water that has no chlorine, or you can leave the water setting out for 24 hours, the chlorine will evaporate out and then you can use it without killing all of that good bacteria and yeast that you actually want to be growing in your starter. And I will just leave this here in a cozy warm part of the kitchen until I'm ready to use it. So here I have my supplies all set out and I can make sure first of all that my starter is ready to use otherwise your bread will not rise very well. So this starter has been fed about 12 hours ago and it's very bubbly and it's almost foamy on the top that's all normal. It settles down at the bottom the the sugar and the potato flakes kind of just settle down to the bottom while the foaminess at the top is just perfectly normal and the bubbly living Oh, it's beautiful. Now I will warn you, this is not fancy kitchen rules. This is, I don't wanna wash any more dishes than I have to rules. So I start with my dry ingredients and I have a half cup and I will use that to measure out a half cup of sugar. And I'm using raw cane sugar in this, but regular refined sugar will work just fine. And then I put in the tablespoon of salt. And don't judge me, but I put that tablespoon right back away because, you know, salt doesn't really make it dirty, right? It's used to preserve things. That's what I think. Now, I'm going on to my wet ingredients. So I'm gonna keep using the same half cup that I just used for the sugar. First thing I do is I turn on the hot water so it can get good and warmed up. Now I'm gonna take a spoon, just a regular spoon, and I'm going to stir up my starter where everything has settled to the bottom. I'm just gonna stir it to incorporate it a little better. And then I'm gonna set that spoon, even if it has a little potato flakes and stuff, in the bowl. And I'm gonna measure out a cup of liquid starter here and I always want to err on the side of more liquid and less dry ingredients if I'm going to err. Now because I'm just using a half measuring cup I will sometimes add a little bit over because you know 
it might not have been all the way full, you might have spilled some getting to the bowl, that kind of thing. So always go just a little more on the liquid, it'll make your dough easier to work with and rise easier. Now I'm gonna add one half cup of oil. You could also use a half cup of butter here. The original recipe that I got called for vegetable oil. This is olive oil, it works just fine. Whatever oil you want to use. Next up is a cup and a half, so that's three of these half cups of hot water. Not boiling water, I just use it as hot as my tap water will get, which isn't too incredibly hot. I use three of these and then I will add just a little bit more because as I said, I want to air on the side of a little more liquid. Next, I'm just going to take that spoon that I've already used and stir up all of these ingredients to incorporate all the sugar, the salt, make sure everything's kind of evenly distributed in this liquid mixture before I mix in the flour. Now I'm doing all of this in my KitchenAid mixing bowl because as I've said, I don't want to do more dishes than I need to. So it's going to do its whole first rise in this mixing bowl. So I'll go ahead and put this on my stand and I'm gonna add six cups of flour. I'm using bread flour. And I am just going to do two at a time. What I've found is that with kids and distractions everywhere, I can't count to six. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's too much. I lose count if I do one at a time, but I can do two at a time, three times, and it seems to work for me. I can keep track of things. I will add two cups and allow it to mix for a little bit. Then I'll add two more cups of the bread flour. This bread flour I got at Sam's in bulk. I usually try to do organic when I'm doing all purpose and I'm doing sourdough. This is affordable for the amount that we make as often as we make it. Our goal is to definitely be doing different kinds of flour that are better for us, maybe milling our own, all these great things you can be doing, whatever you have available. Now this is the part where my kids really like to help. They help me dump the two cups of flour in. They like to turn the mixer on and off and watch it mix the dough in. And they tell me when they think it's ready. And they really enjoy being part of it in that way. And I can let them help out without being too messy. It's kind of a win-win. Now that I've added all six cups of flour, I'm just going to let this mix. Now I'm speeding this up. It doesn't really go this fast. I keep it on the first or second setting in my mixer and I just let it go until all of the flour is incorporated and you'll be able to see the dough start to form almost one big ball of dough. If you have put in heaping cups of flour, it's going to make a harder dough. It won't be as as soft or sticky as we want it but as i've said it will still make good bread and you can still eat it it's fine now i love using my KitchenAid mixer and the dough hook it works great and it's minimal effort on my part but you can totally do this without one just knead the dough by hand for five to ten minutes until it's all evenly incorporated in one nice ball of dough. And you'll find that it's a little sticky and you can oil your hands when you do that. Put some of the oil on your hands and that'll help keep it from sticking as badly. And there it is. You've finished the most difficult part of this bread and it really wasn't too bad. Now we're just gonna clean off this hook but I'm going to use the same bowl I just mixed it in because, again, I don't want to make more dishes than I need to. You could put it in a nice, pretty, clean new bowl, but I'm not going to do that. So I'm just pouring some oil right on top of the dough, and I'm just going to scrape the sides a little bit so that it looks a little cleaner and a little neater, and I make sure that I haven't left any pieces of dough. It's all kind of one big lump of dough in the bottom of this bowl. When it looks and feels good to me here, I'm just gonna give it an extra little pat just for fun, and we're gonna cover it with plastic wrap. You could also use a damp towel or a beeswax wrap, which I have just started making and using in our kitchen. I like the plastic because I can see through it, and let me tell you, it's worth buying the good stuff because I have fought with the cheap dollar store brand, and it is 
just not worth it. Also, I try to think ahead and I make my plastic long enough that it's going to be able to cover all three of my bread pans when I go to split this up in a little while. And now you can just find a nice warm place for this to rise for about 12 hours. Depends a lot on your temperature in your room and how active your starter was. But when it has risen to your liking, I like for it to come all the way up to the top of that bowl, but even if it doesn't, if I need to move on to the next step, I just go ahead and split up what I've got. And here's where I've changed some things up more recently. I have three bread pans that I will split this up into. I put them on a cookie sheet so I can move them all together and not have to carry each one independently. I used to always spray the pans as you see here and then I would split the dough into the three pans. I was finding that these non-stick pans, which we're trying not to use as much anyway, they quickly go bad and I'm already having to scrape them out and chip more of the non-stick surface away. And I spent so much time when they're coming out of the oven, getting them out of the pan and breaking apart and all these things that I decided to go with parchment paper. Now I won't lie to you, this part is annoying. Trying to get the dough split up into these pans where the parchment paper is not wanting to fit down in the pan and they're kind of going everywhere, but it makes it so much faster when I get to the point where I'm taking them out, which is, you know, when people are ready to eat and I don't want to spend as much time then. So in my mind, it's worth it. I'm going to take some time and try to make sure they're mostly even the amount of dough in each of the three pans and make sure the parchment paper is mostly underneath it. And then I'm gonna have to actually cut all the excess parchment paper out, which is also annoying, but it has to be able to get a nice seal over it with the plastic or the beeswax wrap or whatever you're using so that the dough doesn't dry out so nothing can get into it like a gnat or bug or anything like that. So it's just one of those things that takes a minute now and it saves us time later. And if there's any expert bread makers watching, if you have any great tips on doing this more easily or a healthier way, I would love to hear it. We're always looking for making things, first of all, better for our family and when possible, more convenient. And now I'm going to set this somewhere nice and warm. I like to set it on top of my coffee maker a lot of times because it's by a window where it gets sun. My bun coffee maker stays warm pretty much all the time. So I can set this on top of that. I can set it on top of the stove here. I would not want my stove to be on too much because the exhaust right there on that back right burner would cause that particular loaf to rise way faster and sometimes even bake a little bit, which is not what I want. This is the point where if it does not rise enough, you're going to have more dense bread that's actually going to take longer to bake. And if it rises too much, like this last one here, then it might fall when you go to take the plastic off and you end up with some weird shaped bread and it still ends up being a little more dense because it has overrisen. And that's what happened a little bit here. Still great bread, it still worked out really well. I just had to be really careful and it still fell. I ended up with bubbles, which is not the end of the world. Everything still tasted great, but it wasn't my favorite loaf of bread. But this set of bread was a little bit better. It rose really well and I'm gonna go ahead and bake this for you here and show you what mostly ideal bread looks like. I bake this bread at 350 for 35 minutes. Real easy to remember. It might be a little longer than that if the bread is more dense. I use a toothpick at the end to check and make sure that it's not doughy in the middle, but usually this does the trick for me. I will just set them on the back of my stove here. No burners are on and I will leave them to cool for just a few minutes before I take it out using the parchment paper. 
Now, check out how easy this is. This is why I do this. Bloop! There it is. Bread is out of the pan. And the pans are so much easier to wash, and you know how I feel about doing extra dishes. So yeah, we'll take it. All right, now let's talk about bread knives. I have used this one forever and I like it a lot. It's very sturdy and I'll put some links down below to these. Um, this one has been really reliable for us, but it doesn't do great when it's fresh out of the oven. It actually pushes the bread down a little bit and mushes it if it is really fresh. I just recently got this new bread knife and it is really kind of an odd shape. I've never cut bread like this before, but this thing cuts through the bread like butter and it does not smash the bread even if it just came out of the oven. So it's a little weird shaped and it was a little funny getting used to, but it seems to work really well. And there you have it. This is by far my favorite part. I can eat this stuff just plain, straight out of the oven, nothing better. A little bit of butter, it is fantastic. The kids like it with jelly or honey or cinnamon. We may use it to make grilled cheeses. We use it to make sandwiches. It is just a really good all-around bread. Thanks for joining us today. I'd love to hear if you make this. It is such a staple in our house and everybody loves it. I will include the written recipe in the description below. Check it out. Thanks for joining us today as we sew and grow together.